Hello and welcome to North Star Online. My name is Mike Wynn and I serve here at North Star as Discipleship and Small Group Pastor. And it is great to have you joining us today online. And whether you're local or from around the world, we are truly honored to have you worship with us today. You know, here at North Star, we have a mission. And that mission is to help people find their way home. Now, what is home? The home that we're focused on is your eternal home, and that's in heaven. And that comes directly through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We would absolutely love the opportunity to talk to you about that. Our emails are below. My email is below. And if you have any questions, just please send us a quick email or give us a call. Well, listen, the worship team is about ready to take the stage, and I'll see you after the service. See the 
song so much. What a great reminder for us. He's never gonna let us down. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I know right now life feels really unpredictable and really uncertain. I love this next song that we're gonna sing today so much because It says, I'm not enough unless you come. And I think it's easy right now to worry about what is coming tomorrow and next week and all the days that feel so unpredictable. But this song says, will you meet me here again now? in the middle of a health crisis, in the middle of a marriage crisis, in the middle of a financial crisis, in the middle of whatever your thing is today, wherever you are, whatever you're walking through, he is good and he will meet you there. Seth's gonna lead us today. Sing along with us. to the beginning can't control what tomorrow will bring but I know here in the middle is the place where you promise to be I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again?
I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want, God, is all you are. Will you meet me here again? God, that's our prayer this morning. That everything that we will ever want will be you. The desire of our hearts, the end of all of our plans, the end of all of our dreams is you. You and only you. Thank you for this opportunity, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome to North Star. We are so excited to have you here. My name is Christy Webb. I'm children's director here at North Star. And here at North Star, we exist to help people find their way home. And that may mean a physical church home where you're connecting with others, but it may also mean an eternal home through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Over the last two weeks, we've had more than 20 people let us know that they've put their faith in Jesus. And that includes four of our very own North Star kids. How amazing is it that God can take these challenging times to bring people to him? And we know that right now we are going through some uncertain times, but we wanna take a moment to just thank you so incredibly much for your continued and faithful giving. With your giving, our ministries are able to, to expand our reach far beyond anywhere we could ever imagine. North Star Kids Ministry is partnering with parents and families to offer them resources that they can do at home with their kids to continue that faith conversation. Um, some of those include interactive videos, lessons, and activities. And one of the fun activities we've been doing over the last two weeks is a family challenge where we offer up a challenge to families to do. They post it on our North Star Kids Facebook page, pictures or videos. And then at the end of the week, we announce a winner. Well, the first week, we did a fort building challenge. And I will have to tell you that North Star families rose to the occasion. They made some incredible, incredible forts. It was really hard actually to, to designate a winner, honestly. But what's so amazing is that these families are leveraging this newfound time that they have together, and they're using it to spend time with God. They're experiencing God together so incredible. We could not reach these families the way that we do without your faithful continued giving, so thank you. And if you feel led to give this morning, you can go on your North Star app and click the give button, or you can go on northstarchurch.org forward slash give, where you can set up a one-time gift or a recurring gift. Again, we can't thank you enough. So everything that we're doing right now, you probably have noticed, is all online. From kids to special needs to students to adults, we have so many opportunities for you and your family to stay connected during this time. So if you want more information about that, go to northstarchurch.org forward slash online. So today, we're going to continue our final hours series as we take a look at the powerful phrase that Jesus shouted right as he was taking his last breath. Those three words will forever represent what true victory looks like. So grab your Bible, open up your North Star app, and let's get ready to dive into God's word together.
Well, good morning, North Star. It is so good to connect with you this morning. I can't see you, but you get to see in here, and I just want you to know how thrilled we are that you took time out of your crazy new normal schedule to tune in. I was gonna say today, if you're watching from your house or you're watching from your back porch, if you're watching from your back porch, I'm sure you're just shooing away pollen right now because it is crazy how you yellow our driveway our house our cars it's crazy right now so from wherever you're tuning in thanks for taking time out of your schedule I said this last Sunday and I truly do mean it I am so glad we get to connect but it does it does make me sad I don't get to see all your smiling faces so just know that someday soon hopefully soon we'll get to reconnect Again, I don't know what your new normal's been like. I know parents are working from home. Kids are out of school, at least now. We know through the month of April, everybody's trying to figure out what the new work schedule looks like and all that. And back when uh, we were first married, we went through the five love languages, and it was awesome. And we found out I am a words of affirmation person, and we found out Anna's a quality time person. We might be exceeding her quality time limit. So I've got to figure that out a little bit because we're together way more. Normally, my phone goes off and my watch goes off. I'm supposed to be on a baseball field. Last week was supposed to be a big rivalry game uh, for the high school that I get to coach at. And we didn't do that. So it's weird not being on the baseball field. And Ann uh, slash Joanna Gaines, she has some projects. So we're trying to shelter in. So we didn't go to Home Depot. We ordered it online, and they delivered wood yesterday. So I got to do the manly duty of holding up boards while Ann used the nail gun. I know it's not good, but hey, somebody's got to do it. So I'm ready for things to get back to normal because that is not normal for me. All right, let's catch ourselves up on where we've been the past few weeks. We've been talking about Jesus' final hours on the cross. If you got your Bibles, turn to the book of John. John chapter 19 is where we're going to be today. John chapter 19. In these final hours, we know that Jesus made seven statements that had huge significance for us, that had massive significance for who we are and how we live out our lives. I know the first statement that Jesus made was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You remember that? The very first week, Casey talked about that, what that forgiveness extended means to you and I. The second week, we talked about Uh, the thief that was on the cross beside Jesus. Remember, he had thieves on his right and his left. And the thief that said, Jesus, remember me today in paradise. And you remember Jesus' words to him were, today you will be with me in paradise. And you remember the third phrase he used was when he looked down and he saw his mom. I can't imagine the feeling that day when Jesus looked down and he saw his mom and he said, mom, this is your son, and son, this is your mom. Powerful. But we know at noon that day, darkness settled in over the land, right? We know that darkness fell because the first three words were for others. The next three, he was going to be uttering them. We know that the first phrase he uttered in that darkness was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? You remember it was sin had separated us now from the eyes of the Father, had separated Christ from the eyes of the Father, and he felt that disconnect. We talked about that. You can go back and hear all these online. Last week, we, we know that he said, I am thirsty. I am thirsty. And they offered up a, a sour sponge uh, a, full of sour wine and vinegar, and they offered it up to him on the cross. Talked, talked about last week what that meant. But today the words are interesting because we know them as three words. But back during that time, it was one word. And when you heard this word uttered, you knew what it meant. There wasn't a Roman soldier. There wasn't a Jewish leader standing by that dark cross that day that when Jesus lifted up his heels and he pronounce these words you knew what those words meant and that's what we're going to read about today would y'all join me in a word of prayer man if you're sitting with your family right now grab their hands if you're sitting alone right now grab the hand of your father in heaven and would you ask him to speak to you would you because these words that day on the cross 
They got you written in them. They've got me written in them. Father, would you settle into our living rooms? Would you settle into our cars if we're driving somewhere right now? God, wherever somebody may be logging in this morning, Father, I pray that you pull up a chair with them. God, I pray that you have an intimate conversation. I pray at the end of today, we will never look at these words the same way. Because what Jesus said that day, massive to us today. So God, speak to us, teach us, show us, guide us so we can see what you have for us. And Father, I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. We, we know that in the New Testament, over 30,000 words were uttered by Christ that are captured. But we also know that he said so much more that John tells us were, were never captured. But there was no more significant word or phrase than the one he uses that we read today. John chapter 19, if you got your Bibles, turn over there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth book of the New Testament. Um, if you've got your app, it's super easy to find. If you've never downloaded, if you're tuning in today and you're new, North Star Church, Georgia, in the App Store, you can go and there's also some notes you can get online. But, I, man, today's a great day to write down or at least type in a couple of the thoughts that we're going to hit this morning. Let's pick up the scene. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Darkness has fallen over the land. We know that the Roman soldiers are by the cross. We know the Jewish leaders are by the cross. We know that John is there along with the Marys, right? Mary, his mom, Mary Magdalene, and, and the other Marys. There were four of them that would gather together. We know they were there, and the thieves on either side who were at the end of their lives as well. Listen to what Jesus said, John 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished. What, what, what was finished? Well, his mission. What was his mission? To redeem mankind. That was his mission. To seek and to save that which was lost. It was now finished. And to fulfill scriptures, we talked about this last week, he said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. Huge significance in all that. We're not going to get into it today because we talked about it last week. But then it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, it moistened his lips just enough to say these words. It is, you know, if you were in the crowd this morning, I would ask you to say it with me, finished. It is finished. We have three English words for one Greek word. And the Greek word was a word called telestai, meaning it is complete. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit to telestai. Anytime that word was uttered, it meant finished. It meant done. It is complete. The account is paid in full. It is now over. So what's it mean to us? See, this term had massive significance in that day. I know the, the Roman soldiers knew it. The Jewish leaders knew it. They all understood it. When they heard it that day, they felt it. Because here, here's what he didn't say. So don't, don't get this picture. Jesus didn't say, I am finished. No, 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 no. He wasn't finished. The work was finished. It is finished. To Tetelestai. What's it mean? A couple things. What did Jesus accomplish on the cross? Number one, he fulfilled Scripture. We talked about this last week. There were over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled that day on the cross. Isn't that crazy? 300. If he had fulfilled one of them, it would have been a miracle. He fulfilled all 300. It was finished. 
to Telestai. It was done. He had completed the work that he came to do. Remember we said last week, it's like covering the state of Texas in coins, and I take one coin, and I put an X on the coin, and I give you one shot in the state of Texas to find the coin with an X on it. The chances of you finding it are like the chances of one of those prophecies coming true that were said centuries before, let alone all of them. He said, it's finished. Look, look at the way. So after the resurrection, he walked down the road with two guys walking out. They were discussing what had gone on. And look at what he said. When I was with you before, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He fulfilled it. When Jews point to the Old Testament, Jesus points to his fulfilled prophecies, and there were 300 of them. So when a Jew looks back and say, says, who is he? When he goes, well, I, I completed everything that Zechariah, Isaiah, David in the book of Psalms, Moses pointed to, Abraham pointed to, all the great prophets, I am the completion of all of those things. Number two, he satisfied the law. See, there was a law, it was a legal thing, it was a judicial thing that had to be satisfied because somebody had to take ownership for the crime. Look at what Romans said, look at the way Paul said it. God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving us his son as a sacrifice, and I want you to underline or circle this next phrase, for our sins so that just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. There was a pending legal problem for you and for me, and the pending legal problem was crimes that we committed. What was the crime? The crime was sin. It began at birth. We were born with sin nature, and then we just added to the crime all along, and the problem was somebody had to take care of it legally. When legalists point to the Ten Commandments, Jesus points to his perfect life and says, listen, I know they didn't. I did finished. To tell us die, it is finished. I've overcome the prophecies. I have overcome the legalities that could be held against you, held against me in a court of law. Jesus said, I took care of it. They point back to the Old Testament. He points to his perfect life. Number three, he paid my penalty. He paid my penalty. He paid, I want you to write down this little thought. He paid what I was unable to pay. I don't know if you've ever gotten a bill before and you had no possible way to pay it. So you pay interest on it potentially and you just pay it for years and years and years and years but you never complete it. I, I remember Ann and I, we hadn't been married too long. Casey was a little guy at the time. I had spoken at a camp in Panama City and we, we took every beach camp available because that was our vacation. We didn't have any money. We were, we, were, we, were, we, were, we were young. And so we had done, we had made some mistakes with our credit card. So we put a $500 cap on our credit card and we went to Panama City and they paid for our meals that week. It was glorious. And then I had a friend that I was talking to from Fayetteville for where I grew up and they said, we have a condo in Destin. Go use our condo the following weekend. And we're like, man, we prayed about it. And God said, yes, absolutely go. And so we didn't pray. We just took off. And so we left Panama City. We drove this and we hadn't saved for it. We hadn't thought about it. We pull up and we left literally, literally in Panama City. I'm not kidding. It was a trailer that we stayed in. It was awesome that we stayed in that week that a family had let us use and the, and the uh, beach camp people had paid for it for us. And so we drive over to Destin. Never been to Destin. It's my first trip to Destin. Pull up at an incredible set of condominiums right on the beach in Destin. And I remember pulling up and I was so excited. And I live up here and Ann lives in reality. And I remember Ann looking at me when we pulled up to the little area where you check in and she said, did they give this to us or do we have to pay for it? And I remember that, you ever watch the air come out of a balloon? I remember my hope-filled weekend just coming down because I didn't know the answer to that question. I was like, baby, I don't know. She's like, Mike, 
we can't, there's no way, we, don't, we can't pay for it. Our credit card max is $500. I guarantee you this place is 500 a night to stay here. We can't, we, we can't afford to stay here. And I'm like, well, what do you want me to do? And she said, well, they're your friends. And so I, I had to make that awkward call on my Nokia. Y'all remember the old Nokia cell phone? I had to make that awkward call on my Nokia cell phone to call them and to, to say, hey, we're in Destin. We're so excited to be here. We, man, this is beautiful. And then I said, what am I gonna owe you for the weekend? Is what I asked. And it was the polite way of going, I pray zero because anything above zero, we're out. And the greatest words, and I had it on speakerphone, the greatest words were when they said, oh, no, 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 we took care of it. (laughs) Oh, dear Lord. It was a glorious weekend because they paid for something I was unable to pay for. Listen to what Jesus did. He paid the penalty for your sin. Take what I would have owed on that condo for a weekend, multiply it times a billion. And that's how much you owe for your sin. Look at what Hebrews says. But Jesus offered himself as the sacrifice for people's sins. He offered himself. They didn't take his life. He gave it. When my sin points to judgment, Jesus points to his sacrificial death. Finished. Paid in full. Done. Taken care of. To tell us die. Oh, that account Mike owed. That penalty took care of it. Point number four, he conquered sin and death. He conquered sin and death. See, now we don't fully get that. I get it here. I don't get it here. I get it. I get it up here. Oh, I know. One day, though, I'm really going to get this. Look at what Romans tells us. Look at what Paul tells us in the book of Romans. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, he lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. If you know Christ, you only die once. You don't die twice. You only die once. You die a physical death. But the minute you close your eyes here because of what Jesus did in finishing that debt you and I owed, we open our eyes there. We close our eyes here. We open eyes there. It is a physical death. It is not a spiritual death because of what he did. When Jesus had his arms out that day and he said, to tell us die, it is finished, meaning death was overcome. Death was to be feared no more because death really, for a believer, is a win, not a loss. I don't know how many families I've sat with and they come in during the grieving time of losing a loved one and we'll sit on the couch in my office or I'm sitting there in their house and I'll, I'll make this statement. I know this is hard, but you understand they won and we lost, right? We got to keep living here. They're, they're, they're living the life we've dreamed we would live. The, the other day, because I, life is... Uh, a little slower around the office, you know? So I came in the office and Ann came in with me and we went back through my files and found all my marriage certificates, right, that I've done weddings through the years. And then we found all, they, they're called clergy cards. They're, they're uh, when I do somebody's funeral and there, were, there, was a, there was a mound of them and I was reading the stories of them. You know what made me happy? is really they were just notices of new residents because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. To tell us die. You die once, you die physical death, but you will not die a spiritual death. That's why I said we don't even understand it now. We're just living out our life, doing our deal. And he's like, it is done. It is finished. Death is to be feared no more. Number one fear everybody has is death. And he goes, don't fear death. Because of what I've done dying for you, I overcame death. And look, look, look with me. When sin and death point to its power, Jesus points to his indwelling spirit. 
You remember Jesus was walking down the road and he had tarried for four days when his friend Lazarus had died. Do you remember this? And he comes walking in on the fourth day and Mary and Martha see him coming and there's a conversation that happens out on the road. And Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know he'll rise again on the last day. And Jesus makes this statement. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And even though a man dies, yet shall he live. And then he asked his two friends, Mary and Martha, do you believe this? See, the resurrection ain't even happened yet. It's pointing to today. It's the hope you and I have of what Christ did for us. But the final thing, point number five, he defeated the devil, our foe, our nemesis since the book of Genesis. Oh, and he holds that sin debt over you. Colossians 2, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. When Satan points at my sin, Jesus points at his spilled blood. So what if I gave you a little project today? And the project was, I want you to take a journal mom or dad, son or daughter, college student, baseball coach, friend. Take this journal, and I want you to write in it everything you've ever done you knew was wrong. I mean, this doesn't even include the stuff we did it and we didn't know it was wrong. We just... I remember when I was little, we went to Richway. I don't know if you remember Richway here in Atlanta. And I accidentally took a little thing of lip gloss. And my sister, I, I came home and it was in my pocket. My sister used to say, the police are going to come get you one day. And I would live in fear every time I would see a cop car go by because I was worried about the, the and I didn't even know I had taken it. I didn't even know I had it. But that's nothing compared to the stuff I know I've done. What if I say, I want you to start when you're 10 and write it all down. Oh, you'd fill up that journal? I would. And I wouldn't be proud of anything I wrote down. See, that what's in that journal is what the devil holds against you. You do know, understand that, don't you? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and rulers of darkness. And he holds that journal of your junk, of your pride, of your greed, of your selfishness, of your jealousy, of your stuff. He holds that. He holds it against you. And he always brings it up. The minute you want to do something for the Lord and you begin to make a step for the Lord, he goes, oh, what, a, what a, you, remember, you remember page two of your journal? You remember that time that your mom never found out about? Remember that thing that your spouse never found out about? That you pray your children never know? Oh yeah, I got you hostage. And it's going to take a ransom to pay this off. Get this. In a spiritual context, when Jesus had his arms outstretched and his feet crossed and he had that peg under his feet and he lifted up his feet and he yelled out, to tell us die, he said, I took your journal and I shredded it and it's paid in full. And the one that came to defeat you, I defeated that day. He has no power over you. It's really the, it's the cry of a victor. I am done, the game is complete. No extra innings, no do-overs. The final out was recorded. Zeros are on the clock. The buzzer has gone off. The ref has waved the flag going, there is no more to be added to the story. It is done. 
he is defeated. When Satan points at my sin in my book, we can point at Jesus' spilled blood because it covered that sin. See, up until this point, the Jews had been on like a, a layaway plan spiritually because they had to pay each time for the sins they committed. So they would take this spotless lamb, they would sacrifice that lamb, and that blood would cover the sins that they had committed. But it was like a spiritual layaway plan. They kept having to do it over and over. They're just paying interest on something they can never pay off. That day, there was no more need for a spilled blood of a lamb again because God's spotless lamb, his blood covered your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin. Why? Here's why. Here's the part. Don't miss this. Because he loves you. That's why. He was willing to give up his life so you and I could find life. He didn't want to be in heaven without you. He was willing to be forsaken so you and I could be found. Would you pray with me? Boy, right where you're at right now, would you just tell him thank you? Would you? You start thinking about what's in that journal and you go, God, I'm ashamed. And he says you're forgiven. Why do you keep bringing up something I've already forgiven? The devil has no power over you. He's been defeated. If you're a believer right now, sometimes we walk as if we lost the game. The game has been won. He was the victor. It's paid in full. It is finished. And as those words pierce the sky that day, may they pierce your darkness today. Maybe, just maybe, you tuned in this morning and you say, Mike, I have never done that. I have never done that. I'm still holding my book. And though he's forgiven it, I've never handed it over to him to be forgiven. But I want to today. I want to make him my Lord and Savior today. Could I lead you in a prayer to meet him? Could I? It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, would you pray that? Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Would you pray that? I believe you lived for me. I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose again just for me. Come into my heart today, Lord Jesus, to be my personal Lord and Savior today. I ask you that. Welcome home. Jesus, thank you for helping some new friends find their way home today. It's in your name that I pray. Man, today is really my favorite part of the week because even though we're physically not in the same space, we were able to connect. For some of you, this morning, today was that spiritual step you've never taken before. You say, Mike, I asked Christ in my life today. Welcome home. We want to celebrate with you. If you'll take out your phone, I want you to text the numbers 555-888. Text NSC Follow to 555-888, 555-888. Because we have some guys and some ladies that wanna celebrate with you and shoot you some information about what it means to follow Christ. In the not too distant future, hopefully, we're gonna get together and celebrate you live and we'll have baptism and it's gonna be awesome. But until then, we wanna know, we wanna celebrate with you. 
but it means the world. I know our incredible staff team here at North Star has done a phenomenal job keeping everything going. There's kids ministry stuff and and preschool stuff and special needs has some things going on. Middle school, high school, college, our groups are all meeting online. Why? Because Though the church may be scattered, we're still together. And I'm telling you, we're going to be stronger when we get back together. I can promise you that. So, for now, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll connect with each other again on Facebook Live for a prayer time. If you haven't been a part of that, it's a great time during the middle of our week to just get that juice to keep us going through the rest of the week. And then we'll gather together next Sunday morning online. Share it with a friend. What a great time to invite friends. People are thinking about stuff because of the craziness of our world. They're thinking about a lot. So invite a friend to tune in with you. You never know. God may use some of this craziness for people to hear his voice for the first time in years. But it means the world for joining in today. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Then next Sunday at 9, 30, and 11, we're going to be online through the month of April uh, with schools being out and, and trying to flatten that curve and everything. So we can't wait to see you again next week. Have a great day. Stay out of the pollen. And I hope to see you again Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Have a great day, everybody. What a powerful message. And I hope the Lord spoke directly to you today through those words. Well, listen, we are thankful that you were here today. We hope you have a great week. Any questions you have for us, our emails or contact information is below. But thank you for joining us today. Take care.